Hi, I'm Dr. Younger, Director of the Neuroinflammation Pain and Fatigue Lab, and I am a bit sick today with a, some kind of upper respiratory thing, but I've decided that it hasn't affected my general cognitive faculties very much or my word-finding abilities that I can tell. So I decided to do the video. Anyway, I can't say the same for my voice. It is possible this is going to give out at some point during this talk. So I'm going to go uh, relatively quickly and we'll see how it goes. What I want to talk about is a new paper that was published in Nature and a new study that was released that quite a few people have been asking me about over the last few weeks. And it is called a body brain circuit regulates body inflammatory responses. And this was run by Dr. Jen Zucker and their colleagues, and they're at Columbia. And I'm not going to go into all the details of the paper. There are, I am sure, other YouTube videos that kind of go into um, what they actually did. I'm going to talk more about how we may use this to inform what we do in uh, human patients. Um, but what they, what this report basically said was that there's a region of the brain that controls the strength of inflammatory responses in the brain and throughout the body. And this is possibly a site for abnormal signaling that leads to things like long COVID or fibromyalgia or ME-CFS or Gulf War illness. And so when I talk, if you've seen some of my earlier videos and I talk about the brain being in an inflammatory state or the brain being tricked into thinking that there's a viral infection when there actually isn't one, this site is now a prime suspect for how that happened, why the brain may think there's an inflammatory event when there shouldn't be, and that being the cause of several of the conditions that we're looking at. Now, it's not proven, but it's a hypothesis. So this is an open access article from Nature. It's a complex set of studies, but I think the manuscript is quite well written. And it's very accessible considering how complex the material is. So because it's open access, you can look at it, and I'll put a link to that paper in the description below. Again, this is an animal model study, and I'm going to talk about how we may take this over to humans. So let's go straight into the brain, and I'm using a tool called Emmaus. And this does have a free version that you can use for if you want to learn your neuroanatomy. And I like this tool. It's not the only one I use, but I like this one because it does a really good job of labeling the structure so you know where you're at and you can find what you're looking for. Now, when we talk about the brain controlling inflammation, we are usually talking about higher structures. So where we're at up here, this is the anterior cingulate, and this has a strong role on how horrible you feel when you get sick. So this is the, where the mood aspects of being sick uh, are played out. Uh, the hypothalamus, a little further down, is where the brain controls your temperature after an infection. The thalamus is critically important. And there's a few other regions, uh, like the amygdala, that play a role in kind of um, an inflammatory response and a sickness response. But you can see that these regions tend to be in this general area of the brain. So if we were looking at abnormalities in fibromyalgia or chronic fatigue syndrome, these are the places where we would look for abnormalities. Now, this paper that just came out suggests that we need to actually look lower than we have been typically. So if we move down beneath most of the brain and actually almost below the cerebellum and we get to the medulla of the brainstem, there's a region called the nucleus of the solitary tract, which I'll just call the NST. And this paper is suggesting that the NST is critical to whether inflammatory signals from the body are amplified or diminished en route to the brain. So you've probably heard of the vagus nerve, and the vagus sends inflammatory messages and anti-inflammatory messages from the organs of the body up to the brain. So the vagus nerve runs up both sides of the neck, the left and right, and then they enter the brain at the level of the medulla. And at this nucleus, they then send their messages on to various structures in the brain, again, like the hypothalamus and the amygdala, to drive inflammatory responses. Now, the thing is, we already knew that. So we knew the general pathway 
of the vagus coming from the body, entering the brainstem, running up to the brain. We knew that the vagus has a lot to do with anxiety, it has a lot to do with inflammation. And we knew that this site, the NST, was a way station for the signals. But we just, I think, I can only speak for myself, but I think in general, we thought it was just kind of a, a waypoint, a place where the signals were moving through and branching out to different regions. This paper is suggesting that this area in particular plays a much more important role than we thought in how those signals are going to be increased or decreased. Specifically, if you can activate, I'm going to use that term very generically, but if you can activate the NST, you can substantially reduce inflammatory responses. And so um, if someone has a autoimmune disorder, for example, it's possible, the study did not test that directly, but it's possible that by activating this region, you can reduce that autoinflammatory signal and reduce overall inflammation that may be artificially high in this uh, condition. So again, I'm not gonna cover the studies they did um, if you're interested in how they showed that this NST is so important in the animal model, again, you can read the paper or you can watch the uh, other videos on the internet. And I'm sure if, if there hasn't already been, I'm sure in the next month there'll be a handful that cover the, the animal side of it uh, quite well. As most of you know, I don't do animal studies. I only do uh, human uh, research. But I did read the entire paper, of course, and I, I think they were exceptionally well done uh, projects. So I think it's worth reading. And I think they did a very good job of proving their case, of testing their hypothesis and supporting their hypothesis. So I do think that this region is something we need to look at uh, a lot more. So I'm a translational scientist. So I have to ask two questions. This is what I do pretty much every day. I look at animal literature and I say, okay, one, is this worth bringing over to humans, to human patients? And two, if so, what's the best way to do that? Now, the answer to number one is pretty easy. Yes, I think this is interesting. Uh, it's intriguing. It, it answers a lot of questions that I think I've had about why people's brains are getting inflamed, even though their body doesn't seem to be sick, there doesn't seem to be a pathogen. Abnormalities in this NST could explain that potentially. So yes, we should we should bring that over to humans. Now the second part is how do we do it? Now that's the tricky part. There's two reasons why this is really hard to take this over to humans. One is the location of the NST, and the other one is the size of the NST. The location it's a, it's a brutal place to try to reach. Sitting on your brainstem surrounded by incredibly important structures that keep you alive, there's just no way to get to it. So it's still protected, even though it's quite low down, it's still protected by the skull. So you can't get in here, 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 here. And there's no way, absolutely no way we're going to try to like go beneath, you know, like this angle and try to get a needle or some kind of electrode or do some kind of surgery. Absolutely out of the question. There's no way ethically uh, it would be justified. No, no way it'd be justified ethically. Just not going to happen. So it's way too dangerous to directly interrogate the NST. Now that means that every experiment that was done in the Nature paper, we can't do any of those things in humans. So there's not going to be an outright replication or extension of those studies in humans. So that really takes us to brain imaging. That's the ideal place to go. And now, of course, we can image that location. It's we can focus uh, the scan on the brainstem. That's not the issue. The issue then is the size of the NST. It is tiny. Now you can see here that the, the brainstem itself is pretty small, but the nucleus that we're interested in is just a very small part of the brainstem. And even worse, we want to actually see a specific part of that NST. And that's so small, we can't even see it on the scan. And so unfortunately, our imaging just doesn't have the resolution and the magnification, I suppose, for structures that small to be properly imaged. And even worse, uh, I've done 
quite a bit of uh, brainstem and midbrain imaging. And I know that not only are these regions small, but they move. They move with your breath. And actually, more importantly, they move with your heartbeat. So every time your heartbeat, these structures are moving. And we're trying to get a really good picture of it. And it just it doesn't work well. Be like if, you, um, if you're a wedding photographer and you're setting up this great portrait, and then they keep jumping to the left three feet every second. And you're trying to take a picture and they keep jumping off frame. And you're like, stay still, stay still. And even if you get a picture, it's just going to be this kind of blur of motion. This is similar to what we're dealing with when you're trying to image really tiny structures in places that move, that have physiologic noise. And this is just inherent with imaging living humans where there's a lot of stuff going on. And there's uh, not much of a way to, um, to deal with that. So, um, you know, where I'm at right now is uh, I don't, there's not an obvious off the top of my brain first study that I would suggest, although I'm going to keep thinking about it. Um, you know, really what we need is an ideal imaging modality that would show us whether something abnormal is happening in the NST. Most of the scans that we use, I don't think are going to answer that question. So, and I can't go through all the different modalities. Why wouldn't fMRI work? Why wouldn't MRI work? Why wouldn't uh, diffusion tensor imaging work? I'm not going to do that. I think it just, as I go through the list, I see problems with each of those. But there may be one, as I think about it more, there may be one that comes out to the top, rises to the top. And I think actually it may be worth uh, doing. So what I do in these cases is I hold this one piece in my mind, which is, hey, the NST may be important for these chronic conditions. And I'm looking for the other piece, which is how do we image it? And I just keep reading the literature. And then maybe a month from now, a study comes up from another group saying, hey, we just invented this way of imaging really tiny structures in the brainstem with uh, controlling for motion. And here's how you do it. Like, oh, great. And then you bring them together and now you have your new potentially breakthrough study. So I'm always looking for solutions. So I'm going to keep thinking about how, what's the best way to image the nucleus of the solitary tract in chronic pain and chronic fatigue. Now, if you have any ideas, uh, throw them into the comments. Uh, brainstorming can be done by anyone. And I'll look at all the comments and any ideas that you propose. In the meantime, I believe the best approach right now is instead of trying to manipulate the NST directly, we go to the vagus nerve instead. And the reason is, is that the vagus nerve, as I said before, it's more accessible. It runs up here, it runs through your neck, it runs through the, runs by your ears. There's a lot, it's much easier to get to the vagus nerve than it is to get to the NST. We've known for quite a while that the vagus nerve, manipulating the vagus nerve, activating the vagus nerve can reduce anxiety. So it's good for anxiety disorders. It's good for PTSD. It uh, can help shift the autonomic system to a parasympathetic, um, more of a parasympathetic drive, which can help with uh, anxiety issues as well, among other things. And also, more recently, we've seen that it has anti-inflammatory effects systemically in the body and in the brain. And so it may be that if we just find the right kind of sequence pulse, uh, the strength of the pulse with the stimulators, uh, we may be able to achieve what we're looking for with the vagus without having to go straight into the NST. So I would suggest we do more work with the vagus nerve. Now, that's easier to do now. As you probably know, you know, if you went back, I don't know how far, I mean, really even, I would say even 10 years ago, to do vagus nerve stimulation, you had to cut into the body and, and kind of put a lead or kind of wrap something around the vagus to stimulate it. And now the, the non-invasive devices have gotten good enough where you don't have to do that. There are devices that work at the level of the neck and work on the ear. I'm pointing to the left side which would be the most typical starting place for that kind of um, um, activation. But the devices are getting much better. 
And now we're having, we have more confidence that we can have good, robust activation of the vagus with these non-invasive um, devices. Now, it may ultimately be the case that VNS, or vagal nerve stimulation, is inferior to directly going after the nucleus of the solitary tract. That may be the case. So we'll just keep pushing forward. We'll test, or our groups will test the vagus. We'll keep looking for ways to look at the NST, and we'll find out what is the best way to tackle this problem. So I just wanted to present that and kind of let you know a little bit of how I think about when a new paper comes out, what am I doing with it? And this shows you what basically what I'm looking at is, okay, how do we do this in humans? Is it worth it? And what's the absolute best way to do it? Because these projects take so much time with IRBs and you have to get the money, you have to run the people, you have to design everything, you have to analyze. It's a lot of investment. And so we want to make sure that it has the best chance of leading to a successful and a helpful outcome. So I hope that's uh, interesting. Just another kind of scientific piece to keep in mind as we try to figure out the chronic pain and chronic fatigue and chronic cognitive issues that are related to inflammation in the brain. So that's it for now. I hope you have a good week and I will be back next Monday. And I'm assuming I will be right back to normal a week from now. And my voice did make it through the talk. So uh, things are going well. All right. I'll see you later.